Hey guys, Louie here. Welcome back to Acorn Hill and a very warm welcome to you from our property in North Carolina. After almost a week of absence, I wanted to get back to our a series on how I have developed this part of our property that's become a problem area. I posted a vlog on this in the past and one involved me developing and planning out where exactly we will be placing several garden beds. Garden beds for a mixed perennial border and garden beds, raised garden beds for vegetables. On these two previous videos, I showed you my technique in building the raised garden bed made of cedar planks. The joinery, uh, not only for looks, but also for stability for any raised garden bed with the cedar fencing planks that I used. Part two on the series of our Acorn Hill homegrown garden is me showing you how I filled up the raised cedar garden beds using the Ugel Kultur application which basically is placing all the scraps of brown and green material right on the bottom of the cedar garden beds and topping it up with organic compost and topsoil. And so after two weeks of on and off work and building, planning and placing all these planks of wood, all these cedar planks, all the lumber and every concrete mold, I now have this area that we were able to develop as the non-problematic area any longer. Pretty much we have a very linear plan. Uh, we have two square raised garden beds. Those square raised garden beds are obviously the ones along the front. The one on the left is planted with Swiss chard. The one on the right with the more opaque netting covering it is planted with five cabbages that are scheduled to grow pretty big. I'll give you a short update on these plants later on in the video. Now, the ones on the back, on the second row and the third row, are the rectangular cedar plank raised garden beds, which I will be planting with more vegetables, in which some of the how-to video and vlog on planting, that will be a different uh, post altogether. Other than the square and the rectangular raised garden beds, you notice that I am fixing and filling up topsoil and organic compost on three different size triangular raised garden beds that are bordering the property. You see the vegetation between my property and the property of our neighbor. This is the flooded, always soggy, always waterlogged area of the property. And so what I've done is I have reclaimed it basically by placing a lot of compost, a lot of rocks, debris, material underneath all of this topsoil and all of this organic compost that I am breaking in, these triangular areas are bordered by pressure treated lumber that are anchored by these molded concrete blocks that I found from Lowe's. Where I am finishing all of this topsoil and compost will be my mixed herbaceous perennial border and the middle triangle will be filled with shrubs and semi-woody perennials that will also have some texture and color right at that middle section um, when we do our update vlogs on them. The longer triangle near and on the right side of the screen will also be filled both with herbaceous and semi-woody perennials. And while we are on the topic of this right side rightmost perennial border, do you notice that brown tubing right on top of the soil? That's drip irrigation, which is basically also what I wanted to touch on today. I wanted to give you an idea on how I do my drip irrigation for these large perennial borders and how we will tap them so that we could get all of these drip systems into and onto the vegetable garden beds. When we first started our channel and started sharing our garden, a lot of you have wondered how I water all of these plants and all of these garden beds that we have developed in one year's time. The secret is drip irrigation and I'd like to share with you what I have learned and what works for me so that you can apply it also. We will talk about different parts of the drip irrigation where we actually get the water and all of the other little accoutrements that are needed to make sure that your drip irrigation is as effective and as efficient as possible. Now in essence, drip irrigation is really what the name implies. It's water dripping from hoses with designated holes at regular intervals along the length of the hose. For the home garden and home use, they are usually brown in color. And usually they come in half inch diameter or a quarter inch diameter sizes. 
Now water dripping from these perforated brown tubes has to come from a source. It usually comes from these black polytubing. Last year, I laid out the entire garden has a network of these long black pipes that I've also tapped into the live water for our water supply. They're usually put into different zones. Here on this clip, since we are placing all the perforated brown tubing on the reclaimed area, all of these water sources will come from one of the major sources of water that supply our blue pots. I tapped into one of the major water supplies at the very end of the east side of our elevated garden right behind the retaining wall. And what I've done as I'm showing you in this clip is attach a very long piece of black poly tubing. It's a half an inch size and this will run from the very back and will go all the way behind these daylilies leading up and along the border of our property between mine and my neighbors. Most of it will be discreetly hidden between the vegetation and the current plantings and the shrubs and the trees that are bordering our properties. But this would be a very convenient way for me to just tap at will randomly where they need to go. So here's the setup. We will be tapping into that long black polytubing using a quarter inch this time also black a solid quarter inch black polytubing which is that coil of tubing wrapped in that cellophane plastic. This same quarter inch black poly tubing is a convenient way to extend water coming from the main line. Now I have also here my kit, my drip irrigation kit, that one day I'll show you what I use and give you a mini tour. There's the PVC pipe in the ground already dug and um, wanted to use that as tunnel for the quarter inch black poly tubing. I think you get the idea here. What we're doing with all these smaller polytubing is to connect all these raised garden beds with the water supply flowing from the half an inch polytubing leading into the smaller quarter inch polytubing. Once that's all laid out and protected underground, then the black quarter inch, the smaller polytubing, will now have an open end right on top of the garden bed and that's where we will attach the brown tubing. What I'm doing here and I wanted to briefly show you is how I will pre-cut and customize the length of all these smaller poly tubing, the solid black tubing, to go through the PVC pipe. The PVC pipe containing the black poly tubing will lay underground and putting it through this PVC pipe will just keep it from getting kinked and damaged. This black poly tubing came from the side along the perimeter of this new elevated garden bed made up of pressure treated lumber and this pair of concrete blocks. Alright, so on ground level, I just showed you how I threaded the black poly tubing through the PVC pipe. And this black poly tubing will go through this hole that I've also drilled underground. This is below level of that raised garden bed. And it should thread through and come up the side of the garden bed all the way up to this hole right here on top of the dirt. And when the tip of that black poly tubing goes up and through, that would be the junction where we will attach the brown poly tubing using a coupler. And I'll show you what that looks like. All right, have a look at that object sticking from the lower right corner of the garden bed. That would be the black quarter inch poly tubing that we've just inserted through the PVC and ran up and threaded up through and from the bottom of the garden bed. I'm now preparing to attach the coiled brown quarter inch poly tubing to the main water supply. This brown poly tubing has holes that are located every six inch interval and that would provide for more even watering as we by time and on demand water the garden beds. Here I've also opened up my water irrigation kit and has all the accessories needed in order to get this a customized fit for the top of the garden bed. This is a three by three, three foot by three foot size garden bed. It's about a foot and a half tall. Connecting the brown and the black tubing is pretty simple. What I'm showing you is what's called a coupler and it's a straight coupler. It's uh, used to connect one end of a tubing to another end of another tubing, regardless of color. And that's what I'm doing here in this clip. The plan here is simple. It's a small garden bed. And so what I'm trying to do is uh, put three rows of brown poly tubing and connect them on either side. When all is said and done, what I will end up having is a network of brown tubes right on top. But I also want the corners to be nice and finished. And so from each corner, what I will use is what's called an elbow coupler. It's called an elbow because it's a 90 degree 
L-shaped piece of plastic that has a hole that will divert the water at 90 degrees. After laying out the setup, what I did was water the garden bed so that the soil can be tamped down. And here's the finished setup for the layout of the drip irrigation. What ended up was me having three rows running up and down and then two rows that connect all the three rows horizontally. This is a simple setup and I wanted to show you all the different types of couplers per joint. There are four corners and two sections where I had to attach using a different coupler. Over here on the corner, this is where it is attached to the black poly tubing. This is the black poly tubing that we threaded through the PVC pipe. It carries live water and at the end of it, there is an L coupler attached to another small piece of black poly tubing. This is the L coupler right here. This is an elbow coupler. It's also called a barbed elbow coupler. It really fits snugly into the black poly tubing and prevents any drips. Now that small piece of black poly tubing now attaches to the brown with, with drip holes at six inch intervals. It runs along the length of that garden bed and then makes a 90 degree turn and makes another 90 degree turn right at this juncture halfway down. It goes without saying that whenever this turns into a 90 degree, elbow couplers are being used. Now at this juncture, what we're using is what's called a T coupler. Has the ability to attach three individual tubes, either brown or black. This allows for better coverage, water supply, and extensibility, whatever type and whatever shape garden bed one works on. And here's yet another elbow coupler that I'm using at this corner of the garden bed. All the raised garden beds that I have built and will be planting vegetables in will have the same setup and application of drip irrigation. Alright, so after laying down all the drip irrigation setup, it is now time to plant our cabbages. That square garden bed is where the cabbage starts will go, the ones that I started from seed. Now you may wonder why I'm showing you some cutout paper plates. What I'm doing here is I am uh, cutting up and customizing a paper collar that would go along the base of each cabbage plant. These cabbage starts or cabbage seedlings are very susceptible to cabbage fly. The second I start moving these cabbage seedlings, they can smell the aroma of the cabbage and they would start flying around and are known to lay their eggs right at the soil level. Now when these eggs are formed, they're laid, they hatch, these caterpillars will now start boring themselves into the cabbage and that's what's going to spoil the cabbage patch. Two more things before I start planting the cabbage seedlings. I'm putting in some lime on uh, the organic compost just to sweeten the soil. I was trying to go easy on the application of garden lime and for this type and this size garden bed it's just a half a cup to uh, three quarters of a cup. Then I scratched it up and I wanted to incorporate that right on top of the compost. I then got the cabbage seedlings and started digging a really deep hole uh, for these cabbages. They have long stalks and I want to make sure that when I plant them that they are deeply planted in these holes. I also am putting in some vegetable organic matter that I could get right down to the bottom. This would be the long term feed for these very hungry plants. After pulling the soil back to cover the hole, I made sure that I tamped down the soil really firmly, really hard because these plants will grow very big and the expectation is they need to be settled into their planting spots. The other important thing apart from putting amendments onto the garden compost is I made sure that I hopped on top, right on the top of this garden bed and I started stepping on it firmly so that we could eliminate air pockets and make sure that every single soil surface is compacted brassicas or cabbages or anything along their family these are hungry plants and when they start growing they become very big and the wind may topple them and the weight of the actual plant material could be so heavy enough that if they're not firmly planted they could roll over or break a stem and so this will help them a lot and they like firm soil they like these roots to go down deep into their planting spot if they are firmed and another planting insurance to doing this is firming them in will will prevent cabbage root fly to lay eggs in the soil around the stem. Remember the paper plates I was cutting up to circles earlier? 
Those are what's called cabbage collars. They're homemade, but I use them to protect cabbages and brassicas from cabbage root fly. It's a simple and efficient way to protect my spring, summer, and hopefully autumn greens from being attacked by cabbage fly. Cabbage root fly are a serious threat for brassicas such as this cabbage that I'm planting because it weakens the plant and it will reduce the strength of the crop. Cabbage white caterpillars, whether large or small, can quickly destroy a crop of cabbage. And so for extra insurance, further insurance, I'm trying to be very good at doing this by placing a net on top of these freshly planted cabbages. What I've done here is just buy me a regular window screening and uh, small enough that I could tack them onto the top and, and the edges of the garden bed, taking steps to avoid any infestation by employing any of the number of the strategies that I explain in this blog will go a long way and hopefully I, it can ensure that my cabbages and other brassicas in the future will continue to grow and flourish and that I will get a big crop of harvest. So I'm looking forward to all the updates on how this will go along and definitely you'll be along for the ride. Thanks again guys for joining me on this video and I hope that you enjoyed some of the tips that I'm trying to impart and share with you in growing your own vegetables. Some of you may already be doing this and uh, I have been following a few folks online uh, regarding growing vegetables and I can tell you that growing vegetables is very elemental but it gives you a sense of satisfaction knowing that the food that you are now going to eat came from your own hard work, came from your land, came from any organic sort. And in the end, when you eat it, you know that it is the best crop, the best produce you have eaten because it's the product of your hard work. If you happen to stumble on the channel, welcome to Acorn Hill. We are showing you right now Acorn Hill homegrown. These are produce and vegetables that I'm growing in my suburban garden here in Central North Carolina. My name is Louie and hopefully we can see you back soon here on the channel. Bye bye for now.